Welcome back to the Arbitrage Dat Run Show. I'm your host, Donkey Teeth, joined by Kevin from Arbitrage Racing. As always, what's happening, Kevin? What's up, Donkey? I always enjoy the uh, the intro where you pop up behind the logo and <laughs> then I just see the logo disappear. Uh, it's one of my favorite parts of the episodes. You know, I've been editing that out. I don't know if you've been paying attention, but I've been putting some real editing time in. So it's like a smooth transition now. <laughs> We're professionals. Um, so Kevin, huge news this morning. We're recording this actually Thursday, uh, early afternoon, us Eastern time. And this morning the news came out that we've got all these new racing formats, uh, and all kinds of volume of races. There's, there's just a incredible number of races available in the lobby now, isn't there? Yeah. I call this like the, the wag me wet dream. He just... <laughs> He's been preaching this for so long, just flood the classes with paid races, uh, give you a bunch of different options to fit your type of horse. But it, it's awesome. I, I like it so far. It's almost overwhelming, but I, I think we'll get used to it uh, as they maybe evolve the filter system or things like that. But really cool. Um, Christmas morning almost feels like. Yeah, let me pull up the announcement real quick. I put it in here. Uh, oh, that's kind of small. <laughs> Hopefully people can read this. <laughs> Uh, if you go to full screen, but so now the, the four new formats here, Kevin, and, and they're, they're washing away all of the, the old formats for now, temporary kind of thing, just to see, uh, collect some data on how things fill with these races, I guess, see, see what's popular, what isn't popular and, and all that. But so we've got two 12 horse formats and two six horse formats. The two 12 horse formats are true double ups, which, I mean, we've heard that these, these were coming, like I, I, I submitted a ticket. Um, they used to have, I don't know, they probably still do have this idea box thing somewhere on the Z platform that's not easy to find uh, where you can submit ideas. And I submitted this 50-50 true double up like mm, probably 14 months ago, 15 months ago. So it's <laughs> a dream come true for me. Uh, we've been waiting for it. We, we knew it was coming eventually, but we got the true double ups now. So you, you enter for $10, you finish in the top six, you get twenty dollars. You get your ten back and another ten. So that's the double up. We've got quadruple ups now. So the top three in those twelve horse races will get four times their money. So you buy in for ten, you end up with forty at the end. And then we've got the two six horse race formats: winner take all, which is a lot of fun and brings some value back into those variance horses, right? And then we've got the uh, six horse top two payouts, and that's seventy percent to first and thirty percent to second. So it it really is an, an interesting mix here isn't kevin let me get this off the screen so people can see your face when you're talking what are your initial reactions to these four formats how do you like them how do you like this mix i like it i think it it does a good job touching kind of all different types of horses right i think depending on whether you're a high variance depending on whether you're a stable horse there's a spot to run if you can find the right the right field and the right price point uh so i think they did a good job kind of covering all the bases on that front um, it's an interesting mix of having some six horse, some 12 horse. Um, I would argue like even a 12 horse winner take all could be a little different than a six horse winner take all. Um, I'm sure more and more segments are coming, but I think it's, it was a nice combo to, to keep the original 12 horse races and tweak some of the six horse horse ones as well. Um, personally, I've been kind of leaning more towards the, the six horse. They seem to trend. They seem to fill a little faster. I like the winner take all top heavy formats a little more than the stable ones, but I'm sure other stables would say the exact opposite. So it really is a good, a good mix of options. Well, that's a, a good segue into a question I had for you. Cause our buddy Jack, formerly known as good boy racing now, bad boy racing. He uh, thinks, he thinks that we should only have six horse races now, and there's no need for 12 horse races. I guess my initial reaction is let the, the data speak for itself, right? We've got them both. And, if it's if what he's saying is true, it'll be self-evident. Like nobody's going to be filling the twelve horse, and the six are just going to be popping off. Uh, but I do think that if you just took them away, uh, people like to complain. They're going to find a reason to complain. That's that'd be an easy reason to complain. Like, oh, we love the twelve horse races. Now they're gone. Hey, uh, thanks a lot, Zed. Again. <laughs> so, mm -hmm, exactly. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think change is difficult. So when you have a big change like this, it's nice to keep some level of consistency in the pre and the post. Um, and then, yeah, let the data speak for itself. Like, I mean, we would have just probably subbed the top half double up and a 12 horse for a six horse double up. Same effect. Um, I think the data will show that six horse ones are much more popular, typically because they just they take half the demand to fill. Right. So you're going to run more of those. 
it's easier to dodge some beasts in that. But yeah, like you were saying, people are used to 12 in a lot of aspects. People like 12s um, and they're still going to be the staple for the paid tournament. So they have to be around at least until there's a new scoring system for that. I think we're having a paid tournament tomorrow. Um, so it just made sense to keep it in there for the time being. Doesn't mean it's going to be forever, I'm sure, but <clears throat> we'll let the data decide. Now, are you changing uh, strategically how, who, what, which horses you're entering each of these four different races, uh, how you're managing our stable? Uh, how are you approaching these from that sense? Yeah, definitely. I think it's another thing where anytime a big change like this happens, you notice demand picks up. Um, so then it becomes a, a weighing of, am I going to use one of I don't know, Festus's eight races on the day in a $2 winner take all? Or do I think there's going to be enough five $10 winner take alls? Because I would put Festus's odds at 2,000 and 2,200 to win at, up against anybody really in the game. Um, so those really suit his his play style. So you get a little kind of game theory of how to best use stamina, which is nice because over the past few weeks, it's just been, all right, I'll run my five tournaments. I'll run my eight paids at the lowest I can because nothing else fills. And that's how I'm going to use it. So you have some opportunity costs now, which is nice. Um, and then, yeah, the obvious things of putting the nine lives, Festus, diamonds in the winner take all formats, avoid the double ups. Um, the tricky ones are more around like like ready set boom obviously can do fine anywhere but where is it optimal for him to run um and how many of the high dollar ones are going to run to really maximize the profit potential um so we'll, we'll see that's going to evolve but i'm typically leaning more towards the the high payout um top heavy tournaments for those but anchoring pretty hard hard on uh z sum too to help guide the projected roi you know, I asked you this morning if, because uh, I, I, my interest in racing like daily kind of, it's an ebb and flow. Like I think a lot of people in Zed and, and sometimes it, I get exhausted with it. It's like, yeah, you're waiting for races to fill. They're not popping off. You have this mechanical ability to just keep grinding. It's, it's really superhuman, but uh, so I have not been racing a ton lately and now these new formats come out and I'm like, well, I got to test them out, right? I got to get back in there and start racing. So of course I pinged you and said, you know, is there any strategy that I, that I should be aware of that you're kind of approaching this with? And you said it was more or less intuitive, which I think for you it is. And for, for me, I think a lot of it is, but I, I also think you kind of hit it on the, the head here and this is a lot of your Z success uh, from my point of view is this being in tune with where volume is and, and how to use each horse. And that's not a black and white, yes and no, right and wrong thing. It's, it's constantly evolving. And that's your ability to, to kind of sense that and feel that you're just like so plugged into the environment that you see the angles and you see all oh, these, the, the volume is moving for me. Cause I remember when you and I first started working together, you were like, yeah, class three is the place that you want your horses. This is where the, the volume is. And it's like, I I'm, I'm like hanging out in class one, uh, <laughs> wasting away up there. And you just know, because you're, you're in there all the time. Uh, so I think that that's something that people maybe miss. And I miss too, is that this is, this is the answer today might not be the answer tomorrow and definitely not going to be the answer in a week because it's constantly evolving as this adaptation. And um, yeah, it's, it's not a yes or no black and white answer. Right. Yeah. I mean, it really comes down to time spent and like being thoughtful with the time spent, make sure you're digesting everything you're experiencing. Like we often get the question of like, how, like, can you give me some tips on how to anticipate or know what to do? But a lot of it really is instinctual just based off of, I mean, at this point, probably thousands of hours kind of in the trenches on the site. Um, you can kind of liken it to a day trader who has spent a ton of time just staring at charts, uh, living through different cycles and seeing how things react. Like, yes, you can teach certain patterns, but until you're in there in the trenches and can react, like it's, it's just different. So a lot of it is grinding um, and kind of getting that IQ up as well as knowing at the surface what to look for. Yeah, there's no substitute for experience, I think, is is kind of what it what it comes down to. Right. But um, 
yeah, just keep keep plugging away at it and keep listening to Kevin. You'll pick some stuff up along the way. So, Kevin, what do you think about the impact of increasing the number of races in the pool, which, as you refer to, the, the wag me wet dream? I don't know if he's like on the Z team now and making these decisions. Uh, no, he's not. But uh, this is exactly what he would have done, it seems. Right. What do you think the impact is this uh, of this increase in races? I think it, it's going to be good once people get over like the being overwhelmed because almost it's very intimidating right now because typically in the old space you would kind of at least for me i would sift through certain no-brainer joins and i would just join those early but then aside from that you're just looking for things that are almost full and you just pop in and then it runs and it's that instant gratification which is nice but when it's this spread out you don't see as many just because it's spread more thinly um but once i think people catch on you'll notice that horses can only be in three races at one time so if there's 100 races out there you can strategically see like all right ready sets booms in this race this race, this race so i can join this one and know he can't get in there as long as it runs before these pop off so little things like that i think will naturally make them feel a little faster um because wagme's whole philosophy was if there's more options everything gets spread out more more horses can race stamina gets used up quicker um and it's just a nice positive progression for paid racing um right now we're in a weird transition where people are used to the old way so they're hesitant to join. Um, so they're not going to fill as fast, I think, as they will, like even tomorrow. Tomorrow, I think they're going to pop off like crazy because it's a paid race, um, Fibonacci, where normally there's just like five choices to join and you're sweating all day trying to get all the races in. But this one with 100 different races, even with the 12, the 12 horse ones, you're going to be able to just put your three in and, and move on and come back and they'll have run. So I look forward to seeing how demand increases hopefully as people get more used to these variety of options and i think adding in i don't even know if they have it but adding in like a filter of all right i only want to look at winner take all right only want to look at six horse races just to shrink down the hundred race list even within class one i think will help the user experience a lot yeah well then that that was kind of what i was going to get get at um when you were saying it is overwhelming with that number of them in there i mean the the filter it doesn't have what you just said. It doesn't have the winner take all as far as I can see. It doesn't have a six horse race only that I think that that is um, something that we should probably all kind of request as like a next top priority from Zed. But at least right now, if you are looking for just, uh, you know, $5 and under, you can put that in. If you're looking for a specific funnel, you can put that in to whittle it down. Uh, if you're looking for paid races only, you can put that. So you can kind of do that kind of stuff. But yeah, the more uh, functionality they can give us as far as filtering, I think that will will help. You're, you're totally right there. Yeah. And I think part of that's on me, like just adjusting to the new state. Because typically I don't, I don't filter. We have a horse for pretty much every free paid, every distance, every price point. So I just scan everything. But yeah, it is a little bit of a shock seeing that huge list. Um, this morning before I even knew it came out, I was on mobile. And all of a sudden I looked at class one. I was just scrolling for what felt like hours trying to figure out what the heck I was looking at. Um, it was a really pleasant surprise, but the mobile experience was yeah, very overwhelming. <clears throat> but like everything, we'll get used to it. And it's absolutely a change for the better. Yeah. So, so I uh, messaged you guys this morning and I was like, well, how do I know the six horse races? Like which one is winner take all and which one is the top two? It doesn't make sense to me. And it turns out like you need to refresh. Like I had the tab open overnight and um you know some things refresh when you click around that did mm -hmm. not so uh, i refreshed and it looked like a whole new world so if you're like me and you haven't refreshed your tab in 24 hours uh make sure you do that because it looks different there are winner take all flags and, and stuff like that uh very helpful but kevin let's move on from this unless you have any other thoughts uh we're going to move on to that last week's giveaway nothing else i'm good yeah so last week you won the 10,000th race from the arbitrage, uh, what you call it, legacy stable, your initial arbitrage stable. Yeah. Huge accomplishment. And so now we are giving away a horse to commemorate that. We did the raffle, as we announced last week, and our winner was Barracuda 34 stable. Uh, so thank you for submitting your comment to enter into that raffle, Barracuda. Here is the Beautiful horse that you have won. It's a nice Z6 Nakamoto exclusive filly coming from Altered State Machine and Simple Cadence. And again, apologies. Uh, last week when I was doing the screen share, it like froze up on us. So hopefully we don't have that issue anymore uh, here in the, the program that we're using. But uh, this was the horse. I know that we didn't get a good look at it last week, but it's coming from Perfect Cadence. 
and perfect cadence and plain host on this side pretty solid uh, mother of this uh beautiful filly that barracuda has won and then on the other side we've got oh it, it froze it, it for i you know it, it's not updating when i go to a new screen uh then we got all so we got altered state machine which is proud delight and uh ruling legend i believe yep. uh, solid horse though and so congratulations to barracuda thanks for entering congratulations to you kevin on hitting that ten thousand win mark appreciate it yeah i'm just glad it's not a pink colt like like dan hates so Pink Philly, which suits a little better. You know what I've been meaning to say is I think you may have uh, broken the game with uh, – actually, I did this breed. Perfect Take is a pink colt. And is yeah. best pink colt in the game? I'm not sure. People Pretty are good. asking, especially as uh, it hasn't been skinned yet, so it's still rocking the pink colt uh, tag. I know we have Star Phantom as well, also fits the bill, but we skinned, we skinned that, that, one that one right away. And then I think it, it won the maiden, so – that might have been the breaking of the curse. Uh, so anybody who owns a pink Colt, you're welcome for, for breaking that seal. We did it. Uh, but yeah, Perfect Take is an awesome horse. Fun breed. Came from perfection. And our new Z1 double take that won the the Lucky Maiden. Uh, not this past one, but the one before. So fun breed there. Um, Kevin, we missed you on Dan Chan's Twitter spaces uh, a couple days ago. You were in transit and your flight got in a little bit late. So wanted to circle back around to some of the conversation. It was a really uh, fun show with Dan and Keith from Crimson and Souls Vanish from Two Fools and Their Moolah and Jake from Iceberg and myself. And the whole kind of concept was the show uh, of the show was the, the future of Zed and just kind of kicking around some fun ideas of where Zed could end up, uh, you know, a year or two, three down the, the road, which is a long time in this space. But I know you had some ideas that, um, I kind of alluded to them very briefly before I had to get into my ideas. So I didn't give your right. ideas as much light as they probably, I'm sure they deserve, but I also can't do them the justice that you could. So I wanted to give you a chance here to, to talk a little bit about your idea of age segmentation and also get into some of your thoughts on horse lifespan. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have anything as creative as robotic horses. So <laughs> you might be disappointed if you're expecting something as groundbreaking as as turning our NFTs into real robot horses instead of actual horses. That's the 20 but, year plan, Kevin. 20 year plan. OK, yeah, I I focus on the next six to 12 months, um, which, yeah, with this idea, I think it could easily be I mean, even sooner than that. Uh, but the whole thing is, is basically trying to get away from this cycle we're currently in where while it benefits us since we have a lot of the top horses, it's super discouraging for even the new horses to um, come in and then know that the ultimate destiny is to have to go to C1 and race against these proven beasts uh, who they will likely lose against. And right now you, you basically have your 10 race discovery where it's a safe space. You have these on off conditionals and it may suit you um, to avoid the beasts and you have like a, a maybe a little longer lucky maiden right where you can just race against other maiden horses but that's all very short term so my idea was um we're doing segmentation why not segment on age where you give um a conditional which is only horses who were born in this cycle or like the last month right so at least at a minimum you're gonna have these new horses it's gonna be super fresh every single month um and part of the fun of the game, like for me at least, is breeding a new horse and seeing how good it can be. So that would just give a little more utility to the newly bred horses before they meet their final destiny in, in uh, class one. You could even do like a, a one month um, and younger. You could do three months, six months, however you want to do it, right? If we're not going to have horse lifespans and race at boom is going to be racing forever, you need to have spaces where people can better avoid ready set boom and ready set boom can't race. So why not have paid racing? in an open class that is just segmented on the youngest horses or I don't know, just adding age to segmentation, I think would be a very logical, um, effective way to separate horses out from the beasts. And then, I mean, maybe there, there still would, will be beasts, but there's beasts every month and then they move on and then it's whole fresh game every single month in that segment. So I think that has a lot of promise. I don't know on the coding side how hard it'd be. It doesn't seem like it'd be that difficult. They already code for like maiden leaderboards. Um, why not just add in date of birth is within the last one month, you're eligible, something like that. Right. Everything seems easy to us, right? 
it, it, yeah, why not? we can speak it. It could be done, right? <laughs> yeah, I told you when you uh, were kicking this uh, idea around to me because we knew that you were probably going to be late uh, to that Twitter spaces and I wanted to gather some ideas. But I had this similar thought when the, the whole concept of removal of odds came about. Um, Poseidon brought it up on one of his YouTube streams. It was you know, probably a year and a half ago. And it ended up coming to fruition. I think it was a good move, uh, but this is a separate conversation to remove odds. But I don't think it was done in a fair way. So my whole issue with removal of odds is you have all of these uh, horses, we call them OG horses, that have been running hundreds and hundreds of races, if not thousands, uh, with odds data. And they know exactly how they stack up against all these horses. And then you turn odds off. And you have these horses being bred and they immediately have to go up against these horses that we've gathered all of this data on. I think that that is arguably a, a huge part of the downturn that we've seen in, in Zed users is, is you, you're being fed to the wolves. If you come in and buy a, a new horse that's not proven, you immediately have to go up against all these horses that have gathered more data. So I think that that's in part exactly what you're talking about, how to, how to do that. Um, you know, I thought with odds, maybe there should have been two different divisions, uh, pre odds horses and post odds horses, and you maybe get a hundred races or even 200 races in the pre odds division. And then if any time along the way, you want to like promote your horse, you can't go back to go against those other ones, but something like that, of course, all this conditional coding and stuff like that, um, to go along with what they're doing on the blockchain, uh, I suppose that ends up being the bottleneck, right? Yeah, I think what you're saying, especially, I mean, they replaced odds with flames. And you could argue like flames, at least at the specialist distances, the sprints and the marathons is somewhat predictive, but where odds really, really help were in the mid funnel where you had those win um, style horses with the high variance who don't flame. And maybe you give up on one early because you don't know what you're looking at, right? It, it came in 12th and it didn't flame. Let's just punt on it. But once you get more experience in the game and you see a 12th, even with no flame, if it's like 12th by like four seconds, um, then it might be a sign that has variance and it can actually win. But you have no idea with that with flames. Whereas if you had an odds horse, Vanilla Bean, who would not flame and come in 12th by five seconds, but you saw the 5.2 odds, you were like, oh man, this is a killer. Um, so yeah, especially in the mid, I think it was a, a big, a big miss by them to not have like some kind of odds flame or something like that, but whatever, that's a different conversation. That ship is mostly sailed. And it was a different team. You know, I, yeah. I, I like to think that, uh, the people in charge now would not have made the, those types of short sighted mistakes, but live and learn. It's, it is a whole new world that we're all kind of growing through here. Right. Yeah. And I think to your point and to my, my next point, like with the divisions are having a, a odds era um, or post odds era horses. That's where I think it, it becomes very interesting. And for me, at least hard to envision this game years down the line where there's not some kind of horse lifespan on the track, whether it's, I don't know, you can run for a year or two years, or you have to retire after a certain number of races um, certain number of winnings. It's just, it's difficult because maybe the new class system will better make it more attainable. But right now it's just so discouraging for a new horse to just have to hit, reach a higher bar every single cycle, because with horses not falling off, you're just adding to like, to the, to the pool of horses that you have to beat every single time for these tournaments. And that's where my idea of like age segmentation, I think could achieve some of this. If you don't want to have any kind of horse retirement, or lifespan. Um, maybe you could do something with Genesis where they have a longer lifespan or more races they can do. Um, or it doesn't necessarily have to be like you're retired from racing, but you have to race after like a year in the champions tour or whatever, where you can only race against other horses who are past their, their prime. And then you have these like major events who are open to all horses. Right. And you have these, these new newly bred horses, who have been dominating that. And then you have these OGs lying around who are just kind of breeding, racing in their own division. And then they come out for these major events that have the biggest prize pools. Maybe they happen every three months, every six months. And then you get to see how the new kids on the block stack up against Ready, Set, Boom and those types. I think that'd be like appointment viewing for Zed. Um, so 
I, there's probably no stable that would hurt worse if they did something like this than our stable. Um, but for the longevity of the game, it's just so hard to envision some kind of um, lifespan or segmentation by age not happening if this game's going to survive. Yeah, it's uh... – Again, not uh, black and white. It's not binary. It, yes, it may seem to to hurt us, but anything that actually helps the game in the long run helps us. You know, so it's the math is is fuzzy, and um, you know we're in it for the the long run. We yeah, have like, as as soon as you do something like this, yes, it hurts. Ready, set, boom on the track. I'll use that as an example. Um, but if if you're increasing the value of young horses, then suddenly breeding goes way up. Uh, we would make more off that. So just kind of be a repositioning of earnings. And then Zed makes all their money from breeding. They don't make anything on racing. So why would they not align their earnings with something that's better, at least in my eyes, for the game, right? Like breeding skyrockets if you do anything with with um, with that. And they may not pay as much because you have a more finite lifespan of where you can race. But if you're having these big events for the champions that anybody can qualify for, I think it still holds the value of the older horses enough to where you don't have people rioting because of this. Yeah. It, the, there's something here. Um, we're, we're all going to be self-interested, right? Self-interest. It's impossible to, to get away from, but I, I think people get, get caught up in this short-term self-interest or this idea of self-interest as we've always known it, like in the context of the game that we, we know, and they can miss this, the, the bigger picture where if Zed makes these tough choices that do, they're going to have impact and, and there's, there's going to be an adjustment period, but if it ultimately contributes to the long-term success and su su sustainability of the game, everybody wins from it. So yeah, you might lose a little bit here and there, but ultimately it's, it's a rising tide raises all ships kind of outlook that, that I like to fall back to. Right. I mean, like, if, yeah, if Zed's successful, the 5,000 or however many of us that are here right now will just be such a small percentage of the future population where if you're in this early and it explodes like that, we'll all be fine. For sure. A uh, couple things here on this idea. I really like what you're saying about this age segmentation because you're right. The, the, I think we can all agree that the, the most fun with, this game as it is right now is this discovery period uh, where you've got a new horse. It looks good. You don't know how good it is, uh, but in the current construction of the game, your hopes of it being the best horse in the game are dashed very quickly. You can take discovery uh, and stretch that out, but it's still only so long, right? I guess if you keep tanking, you can, you can theoretically know, but like what that that's taking away from the fun in the game too. It's like, well, I got to continuously lose and keep beating up on worse horses just so my dream of this being the best horse isn't dashed. And even then, if you're really experienced, you kind of get an idea of where this horse is probably going to fall in the, the pecking order, even if you haven't lost flame. So I think that from that aspect of really making it more of a game of discovery where maybe it takes a month or two to, and if, and if you're, you're not trying to lose it all and you still don't know what this horse is, that's much more fun. Right. Yeah. And I think that's what Zed's missing right now. Right. It, it's just like, like everything in life, the, the journey is oftentimes more fun than the actual destination. Right. And right now Zed has very little journey. It is, you do discovery, and then you pretty much know exactly how good your horse is. And it has no chance of getting better. You're racing the exact same horses no matter what. Yes, you have these, these conditionals where you can look better against your, your peers, but there's no progression. There's a 10-race discovery period, and then you hit a wall. And that's why it doesn't feel that fun. There's, there's no journey or progression to the game. So anything that we could do to soften the wall or increase the fun of discovery or add in some element of a horse getting better over time, and make it more like a game and enjoyable rather than a here's my asset here's what it's worth we'll just improve the scope of the game and be much more desirable to the broader um, gaming community right and we're we're not saying anything here that the the people making these decisions don't know uh it's just uh contributing some ideas on top of it because that's what they're working towards with this new class system they recognize this just as well as as the rest of us that's kind of the whole point of it even though some people might not be happy with what it looks like some people might be we'll see we'll see what it all ends up 
looking like. The other thought that I had here on this, Kevin, is uh, this idea of lifespan. And I know that you think that horses should have some form of lifespan. Uh, from my perspective, I, I could see it either way. Yeah, it could work, them having lifespan. But I think that that's the beauty of digital assets and this this world, this Web3 world that's being created, is that we don't have to uh, put ourselves in the confines of what uh, everything that works, works in real life, you know, having a lifespan works. And that's part of the reason that the entire horse racing world functions the way that it does. Yes, we could model after that. And a lot of that, I think is, it's good stuff to take from, but we can also make it better because we don't have this, the physical confines uh, to work with. So I think that, that I prefer something along the lines of what you said, where they're just treated differently once they get older, once they've become proven. Whereas maybe you only get so like younger horses get more races because they you incentivize them to be in the platform and you're, you're discovering them and it's more fun having them at that time. Of course, it's fun having a proven championship horse, but maybe you only get to bust that out, uh, you know, once a week, one race a week, they're limited to their, their stamina. So they're, they're just kind of treated differently. And there's just infinite ways that that the developers of this game can approach this. And and like I kind of said on Dan's show, like the, the future of Zed probably isn't something that any of us have ever even considered. There, there's just things are going to come into people's minds that we're not even thinking about right now. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's different ways to build a game for 10,000 people versus building a game for a million. Right. That's, you have totally different mindset. So I'll be curious, like, are they building in this next iteration more towards like optimizing the current system or what I would guess they're going to do is, is build out to where it's actually scalable. And even with that, there might be some growing pains as the game, as the game <laughs> grows. Um, but I think Facuno and team have that long-term vision. He has experience in building out games that have some addict, like addictive qualities to it, which Zed has plenty, but there's missing kind of that progression, that achievement based um, thing that keeps you coming back. So I'm really excited to see what they can can do with all the all their experience and the foundation Zed already has. Yeah. So you bring up this idea of progression and the new class system. And I did want to hit on this before we wrap up here and we will spin the wheel uh, after this conversation. But um, so Keith brought up on, on the spaces, the user uh, research groups that were done on the new class system, which is probably like six weeks ago, maybe even two months ago now. Um, I don't know. Time is, I, I don't know how time works anymore, but um Ringleader, our buddy Ringleader, who we've done a lot of breeding and stuff with, he's the one that bought One More Influence. He reached out to me and, and was asking for a little bit more information on this and kind of discussing the, the, the idea of this being like inside information and not being fair that some people were given this user research experience and see what they're thinking for the class system, which I can totally understand. Uh, but I did want to clarify in case other people are, are having those same type, types of thoughts. This was a open invitation. You anybody could go on Twitter. Uh, Beck put out this form to sign up for these research uh, groups and get our feedback. This was presented in a way that was in no way. This is what the class system is going to be like. In fact, it was like, please don't share this. This is all like conceptual. Uh, all of this likely will change. I uh, just want to see if this was what the new class system and progression looked like, what your uh, thoughts on this would be. And if you have any ideas on what we could improve, what what should change, what do you like, what do you hate kind of stuff. Um, and in mine, it was like groups of five. There was four other small stables in myself. I know you didn't even do it, Kevin, but that was kind of uh, how this worked. And I, I mean, I think it's great that Zed is, is coming in and, and getting feedback. And I encourage everybody to go uh, follow Beck on, on Twitter and s sign up for these future research groups because uh, everybody's feedback is very valuable. We need to have different uh, demographics giving feedback on all this stuff, right? Yeah, and it sounds like, I mean, from what you guys have said, that, yeah, the, the focus groups had a good representation of of just that. And, yeah, I mean, this is what we've been wanting Zed to do for so long of getting the feedback of people and getting it in a very direct manner where you're uh, giving literally direct feedback to people who are pulling some strings um, with said rather than just doing like a blind Twitter poll. Um, so like you said, anybody can, can hop in uh, when she gives those opportunities out. And yeah, I love that the new team is doing this because I think a lot of the mistakes in the past that Zed would have done would have been steered in a different direction if they had done things like this. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of getting towards the end here. I know you got a hard stop, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up and we'll get into discussion of, uh, my thoughts on the future Z fantasy NFT derivatives. Uh, Cause I think it is a really fun conversation. And I know that, well, I mean, I, you and I are doing a lot of this, uh, DraftKings Rainmakers. I don't know that I, I explained this idea as, um, clearly as maybe it's it's a complex it's complex when you're dealing with nft derivatives of nfts and creating a game within a game uh it's, it's hard to explain how all of this works but i do think it's worth having a conversation maybe for next week uh but we'll spin the wheel now kevin huh let's do it yeah i like having a teaser we don't usually do weekly like tune in next time for so tune in good, next time for a crazy robot horse idea you'll plug in your usb drive into your robot horse and you can ride it <laughs> yeah you'll be able to ride it <laughs> um yeah so uh what else was i gonna say here kevin um we'll get back to some twitter questions next week we didn't even take any twitter questions this week but we do appreciate all of those and uh, we'll get back to maybe a little bit more normal format but there was uh, some things we did want to hit on this week hopefully you guys enjoyed this format give us any feedback in, in the replies and comments on youtube or out on twitter follow us at arbitrage run and let's do this spin for the horse that we're going to put into lending here kevin with this week we've got triumph for hours back on the wheel we've got the publisher back on the wheel and we've got ruling legend back on the wheel and then we've added third evergreen which is uh evergreen gates third head correct yeah this is a, that's a really good one that's probably a top two or three 2.0 mid in my eyes at least is that would you prefer to i mean i think we know that it's third evergreen or triumph for hours that we would want which one would you prefer for the upcoming week um triumph for hours i think that's just it's that killer in the marathon funnel all right let's spin it this horse is going into lending the publisher solid mid i don't know what are the uh, tournament formats coming up anything good for the publisher um not too sure i know i know that it will be able to at least be eligible well um they've been changing the weekly ones they put out that three week projection and then it changed halfway probably for the better um so i'm not exactly sure but i do know that it's eligible for the next two at least the first half of its renting the publisher should be able to compete in low stakes paid although well again we will take on uh 50 50 true 50 50 split if you end up losing money uh, running the publisher, if you get her out of lending, uh, we'll take on half of those. So yeah, have some fun running in these new formats and stuff in the paid racing. Uh, she can definitely compete. Um, but we'll put yep. her into lending. When are you thinking here for this one, Kevin? Let's mix it up. Um, we've been doing Friday night Eastern time. So let's just give a different time zone a chance here and go 10 a.m. on Friday morning Eastern time. So All right. Friday, September 30th. Yes, September 30th, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. The publisher, our Z1 mid, really good at 1600. We'll be going into the lending barn. Best of luck. Hope somebody, uh, hopefully a, a, a stable that's never run a Z1 before can get her out of lending and have some fun. But that'll be a four-day lending term. Oh, we didn't even talk about the historical pricing that we added to arbitrage that run. It just came into my mind. It's up there. Uh, so if you go to arbitrage, we'll hit on that next week. Uh, we're hoping to have a, a full sortable page with all historical pricing. But if you go into bid for a stud or bid for a female breed or build a breed right on there where it shows the horses uh, cycles, you can see the last like five prices if they if they have been sold five times for a male breed or a female breed. And the first one that's showing there is the most recent. You know, it's again, it's a constantly moving market. Some of those prices are going to look a little bit high. The the market was uh, a bit frothy when we started putting those uh, out there. So you can probably get them for a lot of them a little bit cheaper, especially the high end ones. I'd say the premium market has come down a bit. So, yeah, go go give it a look there on arbitrage.run. Play around with it. We'd love some feedback on that historical pricing. Let us know if it's clear what you're looking at there uh, and if it pops out enough. Um, but Kevin, any last thoughts here before we wrap it up? No, I think I've said enough. All right. Follow Kevin at Arbitrage Racing. No G. 
follow me at Zed Diamond Hands. If you could subscribe to this show, we would really appreciate it. Uh, hit the like button, leave us any comments, uh, any feedback. We really do appreciate it. Best of luck out there in these new racing formats. Good luck, everybody.